I'd like to start off my part of this morning by telling all of you, Happy Mother's Day. And I mean all of you. Because you see, either you are a mother or you have a mother. I figure that catches about all of us, doesn't it? So Happy Mother's Day. I remember back when I was a kid, hearing my grandfather tell a story about a preacher who was really boring. I mean, he had a definite problem. He had a little bit of a stutter problem too, but he was a boring preacher. And about halfway through his sermon, 10, 15 minutes into his sermon, just about the whole church was asleep. And he thought, what can I do about this? Well, he heard that there was a really famous preacher who was preaching about 250 miles away on a weekend meeting. So he decided to sneak away one evening and listen to this famous preacher and find out if he might be able to learn something from him on how to keep his audience awake. We well, discovered that this famous preacher had exactly the same problem that he had. Huh, he was boring. And about 10, 15 minutes into his sermon, just about everybody was asleep, including him. And then the preacher said, I have a confession to make. A few eyelids opened up. And he said, I'd like to tell you that a lot of my life I spent in the arms of another man's wife. Now everyone was awake. They were sitting on the edge of their pews, wide-eyed. They wanted to know who this woman was. And he smiled and said, and I like to tell you that that woman was my mother. Everyone had a good laugh and they listened to the rest of the sermon. And he said, that's pretty good. So he wrote it down. The following Sunday, exactly the same thing happened again that had happened for years before. About 10, 15 minutes into his sermon, just about everybody was asleep. Until he said... I, I have a confession to make. A few eyelids opened up. And he said, I, I'd like to tell you that, that I spent a lot of my life in the arms of, of, an, of another man's wife. Everyone's eyes were open. They were sitting on the edge of their pew. They couldn't help themselves. They wanted to know who this woman was. And he was so pleased, he looked down and the breeze had blown the notes off his podium. <laughs> and he said, and I can't remember who it was. <laughs> I heard a speaker just recently say that he'd gone off to college and all through high school, he hadn't really dated a whole lot. But when he was in college, he was looking for someone who maybe, maybe he could spend the rest of his life with. And he found a girl that he really began to appreciate and so he took her home to mama but mama didn't like her so he took her back <laughs> well a few weeks later he brought another girl home that he was sort of interested in and mama didn't like her either so he took her back and you know during the semester during the next year he'd pretty well gone through just about every girl in that dormitory and he thought what am i going to do finally he found one girl that he was sure that his mother would love i mean she looked like her. She talked like her. She laughed like his mother. She had similar values as his mother. Hmm. So he brought her home. And his dad said, I don't like her. <laughs> now, I'm in an unfortunate position that uh, I have a great mother-in-law. And I, in fact, I told Mildred, I said, you know, you have ruined every good mother-in-law joke that I could tell because I just can't tell them on you. You're, you're such a wonderful mother-in-law. And by the way, my wife had a wonderful mother-in-law. In fact, I gave her the best Mother's Day present that I could in 1980. May 11th, on Sunday, 1980, I gave my mother a daughter-in-law. And she'd always wanted a daughter all of her life. I'm not saying she treated me like a little girl, but I'm... Maybe that's some of the problems I have. Okay, but anyway, my mother had always wanted a daughter, but never had a daughter. She had three sons, me and my two brothers from mom's second marriage. I have two brothers. And in fact, from her third marriage, I have another brother and a sister. Finally has a sister, has a daughter, but not by birth. But Jan came on the scene before uh, Kim did. Okay, all of that to say this. My mother, Jan's mother-in-law, is actually my hero. She's one of my he great heroes in life. Why? Well, number one, she gave birth to me at a time when it might have been tempting not to. 
1950s, late 1950s, pregnant and not married. It'd been much easier just to cover it up and get an abortion. She didn't. She could have put me up for adoption, but she chose to raise me as her own. And I, she's one of my heroes because of that. She's the greatest hero in my life because she raised me. And not only did she raise me, but she dedicated me to the Lord when I was only two, three weeks old. My mother, though she's not perfect by any means, in fact, if you talked a little bit with her, you'd realize and she'd tell you, she's not perfect, but she is my mom. And I adore her for this one major reason. She never gave up on me. You say, well, why would she give up on you? Well, because you're looking at a huge failure. Now, I realize that failures in life do not make someone a failure, but I have failed so many times in life, I do feel like I, I am a failure. And mom never once, never once gave up, never even hinted that she was giving up. In fact, she always stood by my side. And anytime I set a goal, I set a goal for myself. It's a very unrealistic goal. If I want to be an astronaut, you can do that. All you have to do is set, your, set that as your goal and real, work really hard at it, but you could accomplish it. I want to be an NBA basketball player. Now you laugh, but at five, eight and a half, I loved basketball and I wasn't that bad at basketball. In fact, as a junior, senior in high school in my first year of college until I blew my knee out in college basketball, which sounds a lot better than it was because I was really just playing intramural basketball, but I could actually dunk a basketball, just barely get up above the rim and dunk. I could stand under the basket and jump up and grab the rim. And my, one of the reasons why I could do that as a junior and a senior in high school was because my mother said, when I said I wanted to be an NBA basketball player and a preacher, because I wasn't sure what I wanted to do when I grew up, she said, you can do that if you really want to. You set your mind on it, set that as a major goal, and work really hard. You can do anything in life you want to do. <laughs> My mom always encouraged me. And when I failed, she was there to pick me up, there by my side. I have always loved my mom because even though she had a rough life, she never gave up on herself and kept setting goals and kept growing. 55 years old, she got her doctor's degree. She became this, the uh, assistant superintendent of the Department of Education of West Virginia. I uh, Really, my mom is my hero. And I know right now you're watching, aren't you? And I just want you to know I love you and I am proud of you and I'm proud to be called your son. And I hope that everyone who is watching this can think about your mother and say, things like that about your mom. And if you can't, then, um, man, part of this lesson is gonna be for you today. Also, some of you who are mothers, this is a really hard time, I recognize that. Some of you who are watching today have lost your children, at least one of your children. My, my mother-in-law has lost two of her daughters, both the cancer, both of the same kind of cancer within just a few years of each other. I can't imagine the kind of pain that's involved in losing one of your own children. It's just as Vern Flock said one time in praying for Steve and Mildred whenever Pam, Jan's sister, had died. He said, Lord, this just is not, it's just not round. It's out, he's, he used these words, it's just out of round. <laughs> I thought, boy, that is a graphic picture. This is out of round, that a child would die before the parent. The agony, the loss, the pain. I can't imagine, I, I seriously, I can't even begin to imagine the kind of pain that's involved in that. Part of this lesson is for you. But I want you to know that God has a special place in His heart for mothers. And he created mothers specially. You carried your child. Most, most of you, if the child was a normal childbirth and a normal time period, carried nine months under your heart, giving birth and agonizing pain. And all through that child's life, growing up, watching and 
being involved in his or her life, also a lot of pain. And I recognize that this is not easy and you're to be honored. Every mother is to be honored. Grandmother, great-grandmother. And kids, if you're listening to me, I want you to listen carefully now. This lesson is also for you. I don't care how old you are, there are some things out of today's message that's going to be helpful for you. And I want you to pay close attention and listen carefully to the stories because they're very important. You know, today, most, around, most uh, churches around the world on Mother's Day are preaching on one of two women, most often. Number one, either Mary, and they're calling her Mary, Mother of God, <laughs> which I guess in the technical sense, Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God, Mary gave birth to him, the man, God, Jesus. She could be called in a sense, Mother of God, but not in a sense of a blessed above everyone else. She's no more important in the kingdom than anyone else in the kingdom of God is. And Jesus even said that in a couple of instances, and I'll show you that in just a few minutes. But Mary, Mary was a, a, apparently a wonderful woman, and God chose her as a young woman, maybe 14, 15 years old, to give birth to Jesus. Mm. And in fact, the angel said, blessed are you, Mary, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, right? And he said, People are going to be calling you blessed, and, and we do. What a blessing it is to give birth to the very Son of God, the one who would rescue Israel and the world from our sin. Wow. And here is the one who would do that. And so, of course, people are focused on Mary, the mother of Jesus. And the second woman, who's a mother in the Bible, who is most often spoken of at Mother's Day, would be Hannah. Hannah, who was childless, married to a man who had two wives. The other wife, Paneah, had children of her own, sons and daughters. And whenever they would travel to the tabernacle once a year for sacrifices, he would give Paneah and the children, sons and daughters, gifts to offer at the, at the uh, tabernacle. But he would give Hannah a double offering, double gifts, because he really deeply loved her, even though she had no children. Now, at that point in time in history, that was a terrible burden to bear. That was a scourge. It was, you were considered less of a person if you were a woman and you could not give birth to a child, especially a, a male child. To bless the man and his family with the ongoing, um, the carrying on of the name and the, of, the, of the family heritage, of the inheritance, yes. And Hannah, begged God at the tabernacle one day. She begged God for a, a son. She said, God, if you'll give me a son, I'll dedicate him all the days of his life. Not even scissors will come across his hair. Why cut his hair? Because he would be dedicated from birth as a Nazarite. And part of that would be that his hair would never be cut. Like John the Baptist, hair was never cut. Or like Samson, hair was never cut until he turned... Um, until he gave that information to Delilah, a prostitute who had his hair cut and had him blinded and he lost his strength as a man of God. He didn't live very perfectly, did he? Okay, anyway, back to Hannah. Hannah begged God. Eli saw her praying. He was confused. He thought maybe she was drunk because he saw her lips moving, but he didn't hear her say any words. And he said, woman, don't come here drunk. She said, I'm not drunk. My Lord, I've been praying that God would give me a son. And I, I promised I would dedicate him all the days of his life. If I had a child, I would bring him here to the temple to serve the Lord all the days of his life, the tabernacle. And Eli said, may God grant you your request by this time next year. And sure enough, she had a son. And several years later, it takes several years to wean a child. Weaning is involved. It involves more than just breastfeeding a child until he's able to eat solid food. Weaning is a complete training process. And so maybe even as late as 11 or 12 years old, she brought him back to the temple, dedicated him to the Lord and gave him to Eli. Samuel, as a young boy, was asleep one night and God spoke to him, said, Samuel, and he got up and said, Eli, what do you want? He said, I didn't call you. Go back to bed, boy. 
And then a little later, God said, Samuel, he, Samuel got up and he went to Eli and he said, Eli, you called me. What do you want? And Eli said, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. Let me sleep. And then God said to Samuel, Samuel. Samuel sprang up out of bed and hesitantly he walked into the bedroom of Eli and he said, Eli, surely you called me. Eli finally, wide awake, said, it wasn't me, but it must have been the Lord. So the next time you hear this voice, if you hear it again, I want you to say, here I am, Lord, I'm listening, I'm yours. I'm your servant and I'm listening to you. See, Samuel's name means listened by God. Now he's going to listen to God. Wow. And what a wonderful story it would be if we were to focus on Hannah and draw some messages from some applications from her life as a mother. And we could do that. In fact, I may do that by the end of this lesson. But what I want to focus in, in on are three mothers who are not really, they don't gain a lot of attention on Mother's Day. Now, one of them might. That's Timothy's mother. You heard that read in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. Timothy, Paul says, Timothy, I see the faith in you that came about because of the faith of your mother and your grandmother. Lois and Eunice, I, I see their faith active and alive in you. They did a good job in raising you, Timothy. Now, we don't have a whole lot that we can say about them except that one verse. But I gather from that, all that I know from the Old Covenant Scriptures, these things. They prayed for their son. They had a faith in God. They talked about God morning, noon, evening, and as they put him to bed, they told him stories about what God had done in their life and the life of the people. And whenever they heard the message of Jesus, which I believe possibly might have happened, <laughs> do you like that? Possibly might have happened, that maybe they became Christians before Timothy did. Maybe they heard the message from Paul even before Timothy did. And then they were part of the process of Timothy becoming a Christian. But I do know this. He was raised knowing the Holy Scriptures of God. They raised him reading and talking about Bible, and more importantly, the God of the Bible. He was a part of their life on a daily basis, and they had a trust in God that as he grew up, it was like the oxygen that he breathed that was natural for him to grow trusting God as well. It wasn't just a, a synagogue experience on a weekly basis, this thing with God, this religious activity. It wasn't just a once a year thing at the temple to come and worship God. No, no, no. This was a daily activity with mom and with grandma who invested themselves into their son, their grandson, so that he would also believe and his life would be blessed. I believe that they, like Hannah, had dedicated him to the Lord. There are two women, though, that I'd like to draw attention to that they're not mentioned very often in Mother's Day. The first one is in Luke. And as we're looking for Luke, I want you to notice a couple things about Luke. First of all, in Luke chapter 11, here's what Jesus said. Well, first let's look at chapter 8. <laughs> I, I saw that book as I was turning to chapter 11. I want you to see what Jesus said about his mother and his brothers for that matter. In, John, in Luke chapter 8 verse 19, Then his mother and his brothers came to Jesus, and they could not reach him because of the crowd. And he was told... Your mother and your brothers are standing outside, desiring to see you. But he answered them, My mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Now, is he putting his mother and his brothers down? Yes, in a sense. Because you see, the ones who are there in the house... They're hearing the Word of God, and they're trying to put that into practice. They're disciples. They're following Jesus. Mom and the brothers, they've come to collect Jesus because they think he's out of his mind. They're wanting to take him home. Give him a little R&R. &R. Let him kind of come to his senses so that he doesn't go out proclaiming the kingdom of God business. And they heard that he was doing miracles. Maybe even Mary had seen some of them. I don't know. I know this. She saw him ch change water to wine. 
She knew that that happened. And what else? I don't know, but the brothers had convinced her to come along to take Jesus home because they thought he was out of his mind. Then in Luke chapter 11, here's what Jesus said about his mother. Whenever some women were praising him, and one woman said, she raised her voice and said to Jesus, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts that nursed you. And Jesus said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Is he putting down his mother? Yes. Or he's elevating others to the level of his mother. Is she blessed? Yeah, I said that earlier. She was blessed to give birth to the Son of God. She was blessed to bring him into the world. She was blessed to help him grow up. She was blessed to see him change water to wine and see the glory of God expressed there. She may have been blessed to see him heal the sick, to bring vision back to people who had lost their sight, or maybe even the man who was born blind. Maybe she was in the crowd when Jesus healed him, who was born blind. She might have been there at Lazarus' tomb or at Jairus' house, or maybe... Maybe even with the disciples in name that we'll read about in a little bit. But for wherever it is that Mary had seen other miracles of Jesus, she was there at the cross of Jesus. I don't consider that a great blessing, but she was there agonizing, watching her son die. She helped bring the body of her son down off the cross and prepare that body for burial. Do you know it tore her heart out? Which was prophesied in Luke chapter 2. It'd be like a knife to her heart. Mary, the next day, the darkest day of her life, when the full weight of the grief of her son dying, not just dying, but dying like she watched him die on the cross, Mary was waiting till early morning when the other women could go with her to the tomb to prepare the body of, of her son for final burial. Who's big enough to move, who's strong enough among us to move the stone from in front of the tomb where my, where my son is laying there as they were all talking with each other on the way there? Mary is blessed. She saw the resurrected Jesus. She hugged her son. She ate with her son. She heard him talk about the kingdom after the resurrection. She waited till 10 days after his ascension into heaven on the 50th day, on Pentecost day, when the Holy Spirit was given, she was waiting for the spirit of her son to come and live inside her, just like he did in all the other believers of that day. Yes, Mary was a blessed woman, but Jesus said, the women who are truly blessed are the ones who hear the word of God and keep it. You are just as blessed as Mary, just as canonized, just as much a saint as Mary. And God hears you as much as he heard Mary. No, his ear is not in tune to Mary today. She doesn't have the ear of her son today. There's no sense in talking to Mary. She doesn't go between us and God. It is Jesus who is the only mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. That's in 1 Timothy chapter 2, by the way. So I'm just telling you that of all the things we can learn from Mary and apply to our own lives, let's not lift her up any higher than Jesus did because he didn't. And let's not lift her up any higher than God did because he didn't. He lifts us up equally at the same level of blessedness because she who carried her son and gave birth to him, she who was there at his death and was there at his resurrection and was there at the giving of the Holy Spirit we have exactly the same, for we carry Jesus in us to the world. We have the Spirit of God living in us, and yes, we are blessed because we hear the Word of God and we keep it. We're doing what it is that He wants us to do. You're blessed, just like Mary. Now, in Luke chapter 7, we're, we're told about a woman who received 
a great blessing in life that she did not expect. And I want you to notice a couple things about this woman. Number one, well, let's just start with the passage. Luke chapter 7, verse 11. Soon afterward, he went to a town called Nain. Now, Nain is a city on a hill, a small village on a hill. And there's a path that goes down the hill to a gate, the entrance to the city. It was protected because it was on a hill. But when people wanted to travel into Nain or out of Nain, they went down a path and through a gate. Now watch. There was a city called Nain, a town. And his disciples and a great crowd went with him. Possibly Mary, mother of Jesus, who knows. And he drew near to the gate of the town. Behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. Now you're going to have mourners who are there. They're possibly paid mourners. Oh, and they're weeping with her, helping her grieve, which is part of the culture at the time. But then there's also townspeople there who are just being supportive. And so the whole town, people who know this woman and know this boy are there alongside her there as they approach the gate. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and he said to her, Stop weeping. And he came up, and he touched the bier, and the bearers stood still. And he said to the body of the young man lying on the bier, Young man, I say to you, Arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all. I think that's a great understatement. You know, it doesn't say this, but I, I'm kind of thinking an editorial statement here. It'll be something like this. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus, after picking his mother up off the ground, gave him to his mother. <laughs> you know? I mean, that's what I would do. I just, either that or just... Petrified, I'd stand there terrified, my eyes wide open. Here's a boy that we know is dead and now alive. Jesus said, Arise. And they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God is among his people. And report about this spread throughout all the region. Here's what I want you to see. This woman had left the city of Nain down that long hill. What is going on in her heart? Deep pain hopelessness, a feeling of helplessness. And Jesus met her at the gate and gave her the best Mother's Day present she could ever receive. Now, I want you to hear this carefully. This happened in her life as a great blessing and she never asked for it. She didn't expect it. It was totally a great surprise. What a great Mother's Day gift to receive your son back from the dead, especially when you have no husband to care for you and the loss of your son who did care for you or who would later as he grew up would care for you. And Jesus gave her back her son, not just an emotional gift, but here's the boy that's going to continue to provide for his mother. What a gift. Also, though, I want you to notice, as she came down to the gate, she came down physically she also came down metaphorically. Her heart is down. Her spirit is down. Her hopes are down. Everything about her is down. And Jesus met her there. And in her darkest time, gave her the light of hope. Gave her the greatest gift. Look, Bad things happen in life. Sometimes God actually brings bad things into our life. We call them bad, and, and, and they are. I mean, we might even call them evil. God did in the Old Testament. Through the prophets, he said, I'm going to bring this evil upon the land. From our perspective, it's evil to have locusts come in and eat all of the crops. And we have nothing to live on, nothing to sell, nothing to feed our own families. Yes, I would call that evil in the sense of it's not good. Is it evil in the sense of bad? Evil in the sense of satanic? No. 
But God said, I'm going to cause this pain, this affliction, because you've wandered away from me. And I want you to come home. I want you to know you can trust me. But right now, you're living in such a way that you think you, all of this is from you, but it's not. I need to wake you up. So God does bring bad things, painful times into people's lives. But we have an enemy in the world and the enemy brings painful times in our lives as well. I don't know, God brought this woman, the pain of her life and the loss of her son. I pretty well believe that God is the one in control of the when we live and when we die at what time in history we live, at what part of the world we live. In fact, Acts chapter 17 says those very words. God is the one in control of all of those things. God is the one who has set the time of our days, when we begin and when we end, as far as this earth is concerned. When you were conceived, you had your beginning, but we will have no ending, no ending, for we've been created in the image of God and God is spirit and we will continue to live on either with God, who is love, who is life, or we'll continue to live on without love, without life in our life. I don't know how you describe that, but I describe that as a fire that never dies. Hmm. Okay, so whether or not God brings the pain or the satanic forces bring the pain or this just a natural result of living in a broken world, where we hit times of darkness. We've come down out of Nain and we've reached the gate and everything is dark around us and we have no hope. Don't you for a minute think that Jesus is not there. He is with you. In fact, the 23rd Psalm still says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The rod was to beat off the enemy. The staff was to provide help. Hmm. God never leaves your side. Look, if, if anybody left, it's not God. The man was driving down the road and his wife was sitting there in the truck uh, over by the window and she looked at the car in front and said, Honey, look there. And there in front of them was a car where a fellow was driving and the girl was sitting right next to him, almost on his lap, they were so close. And she said, remember when we used to ride like that? And he looked back at her and said, I haven't moved. <laughs> remember God, when we used to be close? I haven't moved. See, if, if God has been distant to you, if he seemed far away, it's not because God left. And it is, God who comes into your life to bring good things to wake you up and also to use the pain, the affliction. David, King David wrote, if you had not afflicted me, I would have continued in my sin. But because of your affliction, I've turned back to you. That's, that's powerful. That is powerful. The second mother I just want to mention briefly is found in Mark chapter 7. And in Mark 7, we find this woman who... Number one, she's not a Jewish woman. And number two, she has a definite need. <laughs> I, uh, I think that's probably the biggest understatement I've made all day. Here is what the Word of God has to say. And from there, he, Jesus, arose and went away to a region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered into a house and he didn't want anyone to know that he was there, yet he could not keep hidden. Immediately, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit, heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth. Matthew says, a Canaanite. And she begged him, begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, let the children be fed first. It's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And she answered, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And Jesus said to her, For this statement, you may go on your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed 
and the demon gone. Oh my goodness. There's so much to gain from this woman's attitude. The mother who laid it on the line. She's a Gentile. She's a Canaanite, a Syrophoenician. We know these things about her religiously. We know these things about how far away she is from God. And yet, when she came to Jesus, Jesus heard her prayer and answered her prayer. Yes, he hears the prayers of sinners. There are no one else. There is no one else who can pray to him except sinners. Of course he's going to hear her, but he cares. Now, he did call her a dog. I don't know if it was reference to how she looked or, okay, so it was because he's a Gentile and it was what everybody was thinking. It's not because that was Jesus' attitude. He wasn't being a racist. He wasn't being uh, some kind of a phobe about this woman. He wasn't looking down at her. He was drawing out of her what he knew was already on the inside of her heart because he could read every man's heart. Luke chapter, or John chapter 2 says. So Jesus wasn't surprised by this, but he, he was amazed that this woman had that much faith. In fact, Matthew says, I've not seen this kind of faith in all of Israel. That's incredible. This woman, Gentile, Syrophoenicians, Canaanite, begging Jesus at his feet. And then she accepts his statement. If he would have called me a dog, I would have said, hey, 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 who are you calling a dog? I mean, life has been rough recently. Who are you calling a dog? I might have gotten offended and upset. I might have turned and, wait, my daughter's still in desperate need. She continued to throw herself at the feet of Jesus and she accepted what he said. Yes, Lord, but even the dogs can get some of the crumbs from under the table where the children have eaten the bread. Oh, she persisted. And here's what I want you to gain from this. This is what I already said from the beginning from Hannah, what I suggested from Timothy's mom and grandmother what I suggested from Mary, who said, when the angel said, you're going to give birth to this, the Son of God Himself, the Holy Spirit of God is going to give you a child and you'll be called the Son of God. And she said, behold, the handmaiden of the Lord, let it be done to me, whatever you have said. And she dedicated Jesus. Eight days had Him circumcised and she dedicated Him to God. Huh. You got to work that one out. Here's the point. All of these women had these things in common. They needed a relationship with God and they had one themselves. They gave their relationship with God to their sons. They prayed for their sons. They prayed for them all their lives and Jesus responded to the need of the heart of the woman who lived in Nain at the loss of her son. The other women we read about, we talked about, were prayers. And they begged God for their kids. Moms, I want to challenge you. Pray for your children. Pray for them while they're in the womb. If you're, if you're pregnant now or you're not even have a child yet, dedicate yourself now. When I find out I'm pregnant, I'm going to start praying for my child. Husbands, you're not even married yet, men. Make this decision in your heart. Whenever we have a child, I want to start praying the very day I find out for my son or for my daughter. And I want to pray for the spouse that God will raise up the person who my child will marry one day if indeed God blesses my child with marriage. Number one. Number two, share stories of your faith and your walk with the Lord. When you rise up, when you walk along the path, at breakfast, at lunch, at supper, in the evening time, as you're laying, uh, getting ready to go to bed, tell the stories of God working in your life and, and in the life of our ancestors, all the way back in all of the stories of the Old Covenant Scriptures, the Old Testament. Those are our people. Tell those stories. Fill the hearts of your children with faith-filling stories. Transfer and grow your own faith by expressing these stories 
to your children and tell them about how God has worked in your life. Tell them about your own conversion. Tell them about how you turned to God and how He saved you. You've got to dedicate yourself before you dedicate your child. But do dedicate your child. Do dedicate your child like my mother dedicated me. I don't know if that's the reason I'm a preacher. I have a feeling that it had something to do with it. Besides that, my grandfather's a preacher. All of his brothers were preacher. And his sister had married a preacher. I mean, preachers, my grandmother actually preached some. Church of Christ. Yeah, spoke at the Lord's table and prayed. Always had her head covered, but she did. That's back in the time before they decided that women couldn't do things like that. Here's the point. Here's what I want you to hear. What I want you to hear and what I want you to see. Whether you are a mother, a grandmother, an aunt, whether you're an uncle, a dad, a grandfather, a great-grandfather, a father, you can all take this challenge. Pray for the children. Now let me shift gears. I promised you kids. Here's the application I want you to do. Honor your mother and father. Love your mother and father. Show them the honor and the love. And the way you do that is you share your stories of faith. You talk about Jesus around the table, in the morning, at lunch, in the evening, before you go to bed. Ask them questions. Ask your folks questions about how they pray together. Ask them questions about what they've seen God do in their lives. Challenge your folks and then Dedicate yourself every day. Pray for your mother. Pray for her by name. Pray for your grandmother. If she's still alive, pray for your grand great-grandmother. Pray for the women of your life. Let me suggest, don't stop there. Fill your day with prayer, conversation with Christ about the people who are important in your life. But today in particular, I want to encourage all of you, be thankful for honor, and pray for your mothers.